Anyway, having said that, welcome to Computer Science 3172 Web Centric Computing. My name is Pat Crisdale, and I'll be teaching this course. Okay. So just as I said before, I'm going to be recording this lecture in all lectures to put them on Brightspace for your convenience. I do have, there's at least a couple of you that are living in regions like China that are 12 hours away, and I don't want you staying up till three o'clock in the morning to watch the lecture. Um, if you have any privacy concerns, let me know. There's probably going to be a couple of days lag between the lecture happening and the lecture being posted, only because I'm not an expert at video editing, and I probably have to chop out a bunch and let it render into some small file. All right, so who am I and why am I teaching this course? I'm currently doing a PhD in information technology at Carleton University and I just finished my Master of Electronic Commerce and at Dell and my Bachelor of Applied Computer Science at Dell. So I have a very similar background to most of you in this course. I'm interested in security, networks, and human computer interaction and I've worked with startups, small businesses, government, and big tech. If you want to get a hold of me, here are the best two ways pat.crysdale at dell.ca or you can text or call me at 613-875-2174. When should you contact me? It's really up to you. If you have a question about any aspect of the course, if you want help, if you want a reference or guidance of any kind, you want to learn more about anything I've talked about, you're feeling stressed, you want to talk to someone trained in mental health support, or you want to report something on campus that's made you uncomfortable. I used to be a residence assistant in um, Sheriff Hall and in Howe Hall, so I'm very familiar with um, how to support students and get them to the right resources. So I'm definitely someone you should reach out to if you feel you need to. But otherwise, if you want to talk to me, I'm here anytime, day or night. You guys, pay, you guys paid for my time. I didn't pay for your time, so you should be able to access me whenever you need. All right, let me quickly introduce the TA team. I've worked pretty hard to put together an excellent team that will have at least each of them will have three hours a week to meet with you and across four TAs that means there's 12 hours of dedicated time a week for each of you uh, for whatever you need. So first we have Alexander Westhaver. He's an expert in cybersecurity and penetration testing. Uh, he's working on a Bachelor of Computer Science. He's got real world penetration testing experience. Um, he's done security analysis for medium scale websites and he's currently working full time with an internet service provider. Julia Olmsted has research experience uh, with persuasive technology, user interface, user experience, experience with freelance graphic design, interface design, and she's passionate about entrepreneurship and has worked with business incubators to get them off the ground and started as tech startups. If anyone has any questions at any time, just post something in the chat and I'll, um, I'll address it. Okay. Uh, Julia is in the Computer Science Society and in WITS, and she's currently working on a DICS. Then we have Samita Part. She's doing a Master of Applied Computer Science. She's got a Bachelor of Engineering in IT from Turner College in Mumbai, and she's been a senior software engineer in web-centric topics. She's also worked heavily with Raspberry Pis and research-based web servers, and she is Oracle certified in Java. Finally, we have Sam Post. He's got over a, re over a year of real world experience in full stack development at Cashflow, and he's worked with Node React and other modern frameworks. So the feedback that we get on this course from industry and from research and from anywhere you guys go after this degree, it's that you are an expert in one of those three things, but you are not an expert in all of those things. And today, in today's world to be competitive, what we want is someone who understands how applications can be designed in ways that are accessible to multiple devices. So for example, uh, something that can be accessed on the web, have a desktop client, but also mobile, tablet, and anything, Internet of Things like a watch or a car application. And what that's what we're really working for is getting you ready in this class. So I've hired TAs that are experts in one of those three things and all of your labs will be worked on in one component. So I call it the three prong approach. So in this course, web-centric computing, you're not really building websites, you're more looking at building cloud-based applications that can work with a variety of interfaces. And we also work on securing your application. So I often refer to this course as defense against the dark web because I'm going to teach you genuine hacker skills to break into websites, scrape for materials, uh, defend against those attacks, and scan for any vulnerabilities. So let's look at some of the learning outcomes. 
So first of all, you want to understand principles of interaction design, user experience, web design, and connect these concepts to users' expectations and behaviors to increase an application usability. So all of that is just fancy jargon for, we want you to make stuff that feels good, looks good, and works. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with when you've made an app that's just basic HTML and it does the thing you need it to do, but you can feel that it's really not ideal or if you've encountered one in the real world that just doesn't make sense. We want to teach you the techniques to reiterate your design so that the thing you've made actually works and you know the process to go through to make it work even better. Um, we're also going to give you the ability to judge the accessibility from two perspectives, one from the perspective of disability people, disabled people. So, for example, there are color combinations and design styles that blind people might find inaccessible. So then we have techniques for assessing whether or not our our, accessi our accessibility strategy is, is going to work for them. We also are going to show you how to make your website or publication more accessible to things like web searchers and crawlers so that it can be indexed and brought back in much more quickly so that you can get a faster customer base. Uh, we'll also be teaching you how to understand web security issues and identify the interactions between the concept of cookies, sessions, SSL, when creating a secure application, and to make decisions relative to design versus security. Next, we'll be looking at looking at the um, web user behavior and able to construct a portfolio of how an app site, the website's being built. So we can look at log files and see what pages are being the most requested, how they're being the most requested, what are the pathways people are taking through your application, what are things that they're clearly being frustrated with, um, and how do we index, build, and change the site, but also make sure it stays accessible to search engines. We're going to get you to work on um, interacting with others to apply concept discussion class to build interactive, usable, secure, and accessible medium-sized client web applications. So what we're going to have you do over the course of this next four months is you're going to be building a medium-scale web application that has a strong UI UX that is reasonably secure and what am I missing? And is awesome, just generally awesome. I, I swear I had a third point, but it just left my brain. Um, and finally, we want you to be interested in the current trends and technology that people are taking. So for example, um, the, there's some questions in the chat. Um, will these lectures be recorded and posted? Yes, I'm recording this lecture and I will post it hopefully today, but just based on experience of video, video editing in the past, I make no promises. I think I have to reduce it to less than a gig in size to put it on Brightspace. Um, I'd like to put it on Brightspace. If it ends up being bigger than a gig, I might have to break it up or put it somewhere else. I'll come up with a strategy. Um, so to be here, you should have taken Computer Science 2132, 2140, and 2170, or equivalents. Um, I do recall giving a couple of exemptions to odd cases. So if, if you're there, fantastic, welcome to see you. Um, if you want to truly take advantage of this course, in the past I've TA'd 2201, 3160, and 3171. Each one of those courses covers one of the prongs that I talk about in my three-prong approach. So if you've taken those courses, um, I think you'll find yourself at a bit of an advantage, which um, is not to say I won't teach you everything I know to get you to that same level. Okay. So the evaluation criteria in this course, five milestones at 10% each. So we'll get you to do a proposal for milestone one, then for milestone two, you'll be doing low fidelity prototyping, making a security plan, uh, preparing for an audit. Milestone three, you'll be developing it to um, a reasonable degree, but but don't get too far so we can give you feedback, make sure you're not going in the wrong way with your design. Milestone four, you submit something that is much more high fidelity. And then finally, we do a penetration test and heuristic evaluation of the uh, deliverable. Our labs, so there are 12 labs, we take the last 10. Um, my labs are very intensive because you'll notice that exams and midterms have no, have no place on this slide. So you will be, a lot of the feedback I tend to get is uh, it took a lot more time to do the labs or assignments in this course than in comparable other courses like 3130. But the problem is those courses have exams that you need to prepare for, they have midterms. So anytime you think, well, this lab's taking a bit longer, it's because, um, sorry, that's a question there. 
Uh, I'm probably taking, and probably those two taking 3171 at the same time as this, would this cause a disadvantage? No, it would not. So if you've taken those courses before, you might find that stuff I'm saying is boring or you've heard me tell you it before, or you've heard someone else tell you it before. I will be trying to get you all to the same level, especially in the first month. But if you've taken those courses before, some of this might seem like repeat material. Not all of it though, because the key part is the integration of the material. Does that answer your question? I, presumably, okay. So if you're finding the labs are taking you longer than normal, um, remember that any time you would have put into studying for a midterm or for an exam uh, should be going into that practical hands-on time because my goal is to get you ready for hands-on work. All right, and finally, participation. These can be earned pretty much any way you can think of. Um, if you see, like, when I took courses with Kirsty Hockey, I often saw stuff on Reddit that I thought would be cool for the class, and I just sent it to her. And I got full participation marks just for sending her stuff I saw on Reddit. Um, that will work here, too. If you come to class and participate, and I see that you're here every time, great. Um, I often, when I find something cool that I like, I tend to give you, give it to you with a little explanation and ask you to do like a less than 10 minute task to write it up. That's totally cool. Um, some of the software we use, we're gonna be, you, we're gonna get you to be doing hacker missions. So like there's a website I'll talk to you about later called Defend the Web. And we're gonna get you to do some of the missions. If you do more of the missions, that could be participation points as well. Okay. Um, those of you who have had taken a course with me before, you know my stance on this. Um, somewhere along the way, I think there was a miscommunication to most of the world that doing everything that's expected gets you 100. Um, that I think is true by a high school grade scale, but could be wrong. But in a university grade scale, um, DAL defines a grade greater than 80% as considerable evidence of original thinking, demonstrated outstanding capacity to analyze and synthesize, outstanding grasp of the subject matter, and evidence of an extensive knowledge base. So I want that from you to get a grade above 80. And if you have that goal, um, I recommend you put a cover sheet before your assignment. You don't have to, but I recommend you do so that we can see um, where you went the extra mile so we can look at giving you bonus points. Um, I do give extremely clear rubrics that state exactly how you can go above and beyond expectations, but it still might be easier for you and for my markers to identify it right away. All right, light policy. I give more extensions than any prof I know at Dell when it's not a global pandemic. And because it is, I just expect that you guys are gonna have demands on your time that we can't possibly foresee. So rather than going through this whole song and dance of making things work in a pandemic, I'm gonna let you manage your own time. So I want everything done by December 9th. You can do it however you want. Um, on September 18th, I will post all of the labs for the term and I will post all of the milestones. Um, there are some, there are two caveats to this. Um, you can't do anything in this course until you finish Lab Zero. Brightspace has been programmed um, so that none of that will release unless you get a passing grade on Lab Zero. And number two is that all five milestones are made available in Brightspace, but only one will appear at a time, and the next one won't appear until you get a passing grade on the previous one. Also, thank you to those praising the style in the chat. Okay, um, my submission standards, um, pretty easy. Every, everything I ask is either gonna be a PDF or a link to your GitHub. I, I hate zip files in Brightspace. It really ruins the flow. So what happens in Brightspace, and I'll show you guys sometime, is when you're marking with PDFs, it shows you the PDF in screen. You can put your feedback and go to the next one. But with a zip, it makes you download that, open it in your own operating system, and it really breaks the markers flow. Um, markers tend to get everything right on their screens in the right way, so we're not gonna be accepting zips. And the GitHub will be using, um, uh, what was I saying? The GitHub that we'll be using is the one that Dell provides. Um, we will be using a varied version though. Um, so when Dell, create, Dell created us a hacker playground that I'll be showing you guys in the next lecture, 
and they've copied all of the stuff available in Blue Nose and we're able to use it with our existing logins. But through a specialized VPN, we can attack and defend and do all stuff that we wouldn't normally be allowed to do in the network. So I think we'll be using Dell's Git, but if they gave us a duplicate Git, I'm gonna have to show you how to get into that one. Okay, these are the two texts I are required. Um, I more so recommend them because we're in a world where the bookstore didn't even ask me what books I should be using for my course. Um, so Black Hat Python is a book that shows you penetration testing strategies that is exceptionally good and it's been praised in the industry. The only problem with it is that all of the code is written in Python 2 and Python 2 is being deprecated at the end of this year and the author has not yet released an updated version. Um, we have found many ways around this and can still consider it a good resource, so we'll show you how to use those. And PHP and MySQL web development. That is a, core, a book that I have sworn by so many times. Uh, the fourth edition saved me in my career more times than I can count, so I always said that I'd try to pay it back to the, um, to the author. Usually the question I get when I show this book is, do we have to use PHP? And the answer is most certainly no. Um, when you're using your projects, you can propose to me any structure you want. The key part about this book I enjoy is that it's got a few strategies and a few projects in it that um, are very interstack related. So there's a chat server that's shown how to, how to be built with JavaScript and Ajax, I believe. And it is exceptionally good. So I still recommend it as a resource. It required software. So those of you who are familiar with penetration testing will be using Kali Linux. Uh, Kali Linux is this special brand of Linux that comes pre-installed with every tool that most hackers use on a regular basis. Um, it does kind of have a reputation in the pen testing community as being kind of for noobs, but I personally think that it is a fantastic starting point. It has all the right tools. Uh, if you're more familiar with penetration testing and you have another operating system you like to use or you're uh, last semester, for example, we had a guy who was using Arch Linux and he was willing to put the extra work in to install all the software himself. So you don't necessarily have to use Kali Linux, but you have to have um, some strategy to get access to all the tools that we're going to use. Um, uh, yeah, whoever just said there's such a meme about it on Reddit. Um, yeah, there's definitely, whenever you hear someone talking about Kali Linux, um, people always joke that it's just being used as like a daily driver and not having its full potential tapped into, but it's actually quite powerful. Um, where was I here? You also need accounts on Bug Crowd. So Bug Crowd um, is a marketplace for penetration testers. So what happens is companies like Netflix can put up and say, hey, here's, here's what we want protected. We, we're pretty sure we've got it covered, but if you find something, we'll pay you. And um, it's really useful. If anyone gets paid for a bug bounty, I'll give you an A plus in participation, no questions asked, because not, neither me nor any of my TAs have ever actually been paid, but we've tried. Um, it's a very, it's kind of fun to go through and I've learned a lot from trying. Um, we're also using a website called Defend the Web, and that is a website that does missions that teach you how to take advantage of uh, certain vulnerabilities and its introduction to pen testing. So all of this setup will be covered in Lab Zero, so you don't have to worry about it right now. We use Kali Linux to work for penetration testing, and CIA uses it and gives us a large list of every security feature we feel. Hmm. That's pretty awesome, actually. It's definitely, it's definitely good for that. Uh, you can, if you want, you can share, um, share with us more about it later. Uh, I recommend everyone have the chat open because it's right on my screen. So if I ever abruptly change topics, it's because I'm reading the chat. Okay. So responsible computing. I'm going to teach you how to scan websites for weaknesses, scrape the web for information, and attack like black hat hat. Black Hat Hackers. Dalhousie's given us a special um, playground of practice. I'll cover how to access it next lecture. Other than the things I tell you to attack, you cannot. Um, very bad things will happen to you that are not even something that I'll do to you. It is, uh, depending on what you've attacked or what you've scanned, it could be a criminal offense. Um, right now, I just finished a, TA fa uh, a faculty meeting where they were talking about analyzing IP addresses with access to um, Brightspace and Chegg to figure out if people were collaborating. So right now, especially, um, 
academic resources, if they're penetration tested, could be deemed as academic offenses. Um, yes, use a VPN that was discussed. Um, yes, use VPNs all the time. Um, but don't attack anything because they, they're pretty intense about it, right, especially right now. And it's a great power, great responsibility. So does anyone have any questions? How do they pull IPs from Chegg? Great question. So Chegg has an ironically named program called the Honor Code. And what it what someone can do if they prove that they're a dean, which our deans already have done, is they can make a relationship with Chegg where they can say, hey, who has accessed this resource? What IP address has accessed it? And what user accounts? And what email accounts are associated with those users? And just recently in the last semester, we found that people signed up for Chegg using their Dalhousie. Um, you would be correct in that assumption. Um, they were able to figure out who, what user accounts were associated with things that have been seen at Dal, like perfect academic questions that like word for word from open book exams were put in. And they caught that by searching for their own questions. Then they asked Chegg what user accounts were able to see this and then they proved that the people who looked at it had the same answers on the exam those people might have to repeat the course or something and i was told to tell you that we are um, tracking a lot of ip addresses and a lot of things on Chegg and course hero so i don't recommend you use those sources um, speaking of my sources my resources are free for anyone to use you're welcome to share them with your friends you're welcome to give them to whoever um, I do ask that you don't put them on Course Hero or Chegg, because one time what happened a few semesters ago is I, I have a Google alert for my name to watch for these kinds of things, and I clicked on a link, and I saw a PowerPoint slide that I created, and a pop-up that said, um, please help support our community and pay to see this PowerPoint. And I was so enraged, and I got the whole thing taken down. So you guys are welcome to use my resources however you want but just don't give them to anyone that will try to monetize them because that's not fair to me, but I, I like knowledge to be out there as much as possible. Cool. Where did the chat go? Well, does anyone have any other questions about the course? um TAs de uh, deadlines assignments anything else like that right now or should I just jump into talking about the internet and how it works I don't know what R H E L is oh okay so um these slides I'm using are oh gotcha I didn't know that actually cool um these slides are based on a textbook that you will undoubtedly see in your academic career. Um, they just released a new one. Um, Kiros and Ross, they are sort of experts in the networking space. And they always give free slides to any academic that wants them uh, to explain their concepts. The only question is I have to do a shameless plug explaining where the slides came from. So if ever you're interested in finding out more, these, these guys will likely be who you'll read in 3171 if you haven't taken it already. So I'm going to be talking to you guys now about what the internet is and what our goals are because we are now working on creating applications that have the base level code execution in the web and they're accessible from a multitude of devices. So for example, we see, we see Netflix. Netflix is accessible from uh, apps. There are IoT devices like fridges that are able to access Netflix content, um, game consoles that are able to access Netflix content. We've got set-top boxes that can do it, and it's got a web interface. And all of these technologies rely on the same way of connecting to the internet to deliver the content. And then when it gets down to the device itself, it's more the interface and processor-specific things that work at that level. So we are going to be talking about the terms. So. We talk about network edge, network core, performance, and protocol. So those of you who've taken networking courses before have probably heard of the TCP IP stack. 
uh, which talks about things like the application layer, the transport layer, the, the network layer, the data link layer, and the physical layer. In this course, we are only concerned with the application layer. Um, and by extension of only being concerned with one layer, we are also concerned with how it connects to the layer below. But after that, it's beyond, beyond our scope. So we're not worrying about how, using Netflix as the example, we're not going to worry about how individual processors in an IoT device uh, render video files versus an ARM processor or an Intel processor. That's so beyond us. And we're not going to worry about how Netflix routes its data for good traffic and good quality of service. We're going to be more concerned with how Netflix is able to make a connection between their servers and any device to deliver an application for service. Does that make sense to everyone that that's what we're focusing on? So presumably, you guys being computer science students in 2020, I don't need to worry too much about explaining to you what the internet is. But what I'm more concerned with is how the internet works. So a lot of the time we think about the internet as you buy it, or buy a connection to it from Bell, Eastlink, Rogers, Telus, whoever. Um, but it's a lot more complicated than that. It's actually, those are just another network that you are connecting to and they have infrastructure, but there's more than one ISP and there's tons in the, and there's tons of different ones in the world. How are we all connected together? Um, every country has what we call backbone networks or national service providers that you've almost never heard of, but they're the ones who are supplying the base level, like the base level connections between internet service providers, between countries and between important things like that. And we also see companies that are providing massive amount of content that have data sensors that are pumping out massive amounts of data uh, for the masses to collect, right? Like, it's not like Netflix is only accessible if you have Bell or if you have Rogers. Netflix is accessible to everyone, regardless of how they connect to the internet, just that they're connected. So we gotta keep in mind that all those ISPs are connected together. So we won't worry about things like packet switchers and routers. Um, I will briefly explain what they are. Um, a router is just a device that exists for entirely one purpose, which is to leave the network and go to a different one. So your house is a network, you have a router that leaves to your internet service provider network, that router is called a modem. Um, every network has a way of leaving, it is called a router. If a network doesn't have a router, it is just a local aerial network, it has no way of leaving. A switch is a layer below the router. It is only concerned with sending data on the same network. This often confuses networking students when they first get involved, but we won't be worrying about that in this course. For our purposes, things are making a direct connection. So I won't need to worry about fiber, copper, radio, satellite, and how they transmit individual bits to make signal that we interpret as our Netflix. So this is where things are gonna start getting interesting because in the past, we had computers and we, at least people in my generation, I'm not sure all the demographics in here, um, we sort of grew up and we saw cell phones go from texting with T9 to being more powerful than the computers that sent rockets to the moon. But now we're seeing a new generation of things evolve. We're calling it IoT, and this is a lot of what's influencing the development of uh, 5G networking. So we're seeing devices that used to simply be a watch, used to simply be a thermostat, that are now powering things that we never imagined uh, they could. Like we're getting thermostats that not only can control the temperature in the house, but they can also play music. They can also, uh, I, think, I think Amazon's actually coming up with like buttons you can put around your house to like buy things when you need them. Like uh, I think there's a professor in law, his name's David Frazier, and if you get to know him, he's one of the best lawyers in the country. Um, he was telling me about this like thing Amazon tried to do that I think they got, they succeeded, but it was a legal nightmare. It was like a button you put on your washing machine. And every time you push it, um, 24 hours from that button press, Amazon will confirm and ship to you a bottle of Tide. And you could just buy these buttons and put them anywhere in your house. And anytime you needed a refill on something, you just put the button. You got an email saying the button's been hit. And if you don't do anything in 24 hours, the, the shipment happens. And that's something that's unbelievable. And we're seeing that now, but it's affecting how our networks are structured. It's affecting how we interact with our networks. And most importantly, it's affecting our quality of service. So networks now have been developed to connect to individual 
uh, devices, and that's one of the big advantages we see with 5G. And as always, what happens is I start talking and I forget to move the slides. So this is what I was talking about before. We see networks that, that contain many things and then they connect to other networks and the global connection of all networks is called the internet. So we see streaming video can connect to, for some reason, a car, which is probably a terrible idea. And we see these routers that are enabling local or regional ISPs to connect to the national, uh, the national or global ISPs so that we can have connections between modular cell phone link, cell phone networks with bell networks to Rogers networks to European networks to wherever. So we have ways to program networks that are universally defined so that every computer in the world knows what to do. We call those RFCs, um, but we have protocols. So can anyone in the chat think of some protocols that you might have talked about in other networking courses? HTTPS, that's an excellent example. Uh, TCP, TCP, UDP are protocols that are at the network layer. Um, FTP, I think that's an application layer. These are all awesome protocols. So uh, somewhere along the way, you're gonna see a graph or a diagram that shows protocols at each layer. So the protocols that we're gonna be concerning ourselves with are HTTP, which is hypertext transfer protocol and HTTPS, which is hypertext transfer protocol over SSL. And that is the main method for sending data from one website to another. Um, we're also going to be looking at DNS, which is one of the easiest ways to launch attacks. Um, so how a DNS server works is it says, say I, say I put in google.ca, a DNS server will tell me the IP address for google.ca, but if I have a rogue DNS server, that I'm connected to, it could tell me the name, it could tell me an IP address for a different website that I might use as Google login, but it's actually a rogue Google that is stolen my credentials, but looks the same. Uh, so DNS is what we'll be looking at. SMTP has been suggested, that's, that's, um, that's email. That one is application layer, but it's not one that I'm particularly an expert in, so we won't be talking about it too, too much. Um, I'm, it would be fun to have you guys make a mail client though, if there's time. It's actually a lot of fun to do that because you can see um, from different vantage points like how mail works on a server and then you've got your clients, your phone, whatever, that, whatever that's accessing the email and how it interacts with the server. So we can look at some human protocols. Hi, hi, got the time, two o'clock. So all a protocol is is a set of rules. Um, we, we use protocols every day without even realizing it. Every time our computers connect, they're connected to a protocol. But hi, how are you? Hi, got the time. Like all these pleasantries that we all sort of universally follow the same way, those are protocols and that's how we program our devices to interact with each other. Do I have any questions in the chat, by the way, before I move on? So we'll look at the network edge. So things you'll be saying, hearing me talk about a lot are hosts, clients, and servers. So a host is just, a, a host can be any node on the network relative to where you are. A client is the one requesting data and a server is the one that is giving the data. So every single one of you right now, you are accessing your, this lecture on a client computer and you are reaching out to a server that is, pulling me down to your computer. I'm actually also on a client computer and I'm uploading um, my, my video to the server for it to pull down. You do not have a direct connection to my computer. So we are all on client computers connecting from a server. Um, there's some flickering issues. So I'm connected via ethernet on a I think 500 megabit per second line. Um, my mom recently upgraded the Wi-Fi and uh, Bell threw in like this promotion that is enough internet to essentially power like seven businesses. I was like laughing so hard at how overkill it was. Um, and I'm connected directly to the like, fiber optic over like a ethernet. So if there's a problem, I'm not, th I'm not saying it's me, but I, I'd be very concerned if that internet um, package she bought is, uh, causing the problem. Okay. Cool. 
So how do we connect to these networks? I talked about this already. Uh, we can skip this. This is all cable-based stuff. Do, do, do. Does anyone need a refresher on how like the network, how the infrastructure of a home network would work? No? Okay. Let's move on. One stop application layer. I should have the other one. Cool. So I think that slide deck is done being useful to us now because it is an overview of all 50, um, of all seven, or actually it's five now, all five layers. When I learned how to do networking, um, we had a seven layer model called the OSI model. And right after the semester i learned after the whole industry changed and because i have the mnemonic for remembering the set the seven one i always think it's still seven but it's five now okay so we are now looking at creating network applications so we're going to write programs that run on different end systems and communicate over the network so something like a chat server and we're not focusing on any other part of the network So another thing about servers that's actually kind of interesting is servers are software, not hardware. And a lot of the time when we think of server, what we're thinking of is massive, super cooled rooms that have nothing but consoles. And in reality, a Raspberry Pi can be a server. It wouldn't be a good one, but it still counts. So a server is really any computer that's running all the time and that is accessible on a network from a client. And one of the things we're looking at with servers is their operating systems. And this isn't an operating system course, so if you haven't taken that course, don't worry. But they're always running processes, and they've always got different processes and different threads for every single person that's connected to them. So sometimes when you think about your applications, you're gonna be thinking about having multiple people connected at the same time, what's that gonna mean? And in some cases, that might just be like in Java with an object-oriented programming paradigm where everyone who's connected gets an object. But if the objects are able to interact with each other, you might have to start looking at ways to protect your data from other people that are on the network, right? Like if, say for example, there's this, there's this horrible parallel universe where only one show on Netflix can be watched by one person at a time, you'd have to um, find a way to make sure that two people weren't pulling down from it at once. If you've got a program where only 200 people can register for something and someone has started the registration process, you have to find a way to reserve that seat for them so that someone who's finished faster can, can't steal your spot essentially. So we're gonna be looking a bit at how to manage multiple users on a web interface as well as managing the processes. But if you're more interested in the operating system component, I recommend you take cloud computing, which is the course after this one. It's a fourth year grad course that will talk more about building um, network applications that can manage that kind of traffic. Okay, so now we're gonna be talking about something called sockets. So normally in networks, what we talk about is addressing is IP addressing, right? Everyone is familiar with that concept, IPv4. We all have a public IP address. It's just like our street address and it's how data gets to us. Is everyone cool on that topic? If there's anyone who needs a refresher, you can send me a message in the chat. I just, I just wanna know where you guys are at. Okay, so I'll assume everyone's good for now, but if you need a refresher on it, let me know and I'll sit down with you and explain it. So a socket is an IP address and a port number. So port numbers are pathways that we use to identify where traffic is going once it's reached its destination. So for example, on my computer right now, I've got multiple things that are coming and going from my computer. So um, if ever you put a, a firewall on a Mac and you do an outgoing firewall, you will see how much traffic a Mac is actually sending out to Apple for things like widgets, things like the operating system, things you wouldn't even think of. And they're sending this traffic out and receiving, and it's all doing things that are performing better quality of service on your computer. But when that traffic comes back, how does it know what the difference between one program is 
and the program and the data that I need to keep giving this lecture. How does the computer know that? Because it's all coming to the same IP address on the same local area network. Yes. And, uh, DDoS delivery system. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, what we use are ports. So, for example, all HTTP traffic comes in usually on port 80 unless otherwise specified. All HTTPS traffic comes in at port 43. So that way the computer can say what applications have requested HTTPS traffic and then the browser can say, hey, that was me. And from there it, it works out. But we have to be able to develop what's called a socket so that that connection can be made. Otherwise, the operating system would just be a massive mess cleaning up all these different networks uh, communications. So identifiers include both IP address and port numbers. So we see HTTP is 80, mail server is 25. So we're sending IP address, port number, and that way we know what the message is. The next thing we do to define a message is just like a letter. Letters have letterheads. So we have, before the payload of the message itself, there are headers saying what IP address is it going from, what IP address is it going to, what port is it going to? Um, is it a request? Is it a response? Is it a notification? What is it? And I don't mean like notifications like, um, like someone texted you. It's um, some protocols have defined one way messages to say, hey, this has been sent. Uh, it doesn't require a response, but some protocols are designed to connect two parties and have them um, exchange information. So with HTTP, when I click on the link, what I'm saying to the server and the data I'm sending is HTTP GET. It is a request. Um, what's, okay, I'm gonna get back to that in a second because that might be a good question. Um, I'm asking the server to give me HTTP data and its response message, which is a different exchange, will be the, the HTML that I responded as an HTTP response where the HTML that needs to be rendered by my browser is the payload. Uh, so, so we have this, um, anyone can go look at HTTP and the documentation available right now, but things like Skype, um, they're gonna keep this stuff proprietary so people can't imitate them. Uh, so there's a question in the chat um, about, um, uh, DDoS delivery system. Um, my apologies, I just haven't heard you mention packets header. Okay. No, we just we just covered those. Um, so the question was. Um, yeah, I just have to find somebody to yeah. take over the place. So I got a question that is: um, Is the course team based or individual place? Um, I don't know if I missed that or not. Um, I you can do it in groups or you can do it individually. Whatever is better for you. Um, given that this is just a sea of 65 black squares and me talking, um, I don't expect you to be able to find people and nor do I want to randomly group you with people that are all over the world trying to study the same material. So you're welcome to do it on your own. You can also do it in the team, but if you do it on the team, my expectations for quality will be higher because you're more than one person. Does that answer your question? Okay. So then we start looking at things like data integrity. So for example, in, in the transport layer protocol, which is just below the application layer protocol, we have two protocols, T, er, layer, the application layer and transport layer. We have two protocols, TCP and UDP. UDP is connectionless, so it just, it just sends the data and it doesn't know if it's getting there or if it's getting back. And TCP, uses the protocol of, hey, how are you? Good, how are you? To make sure that the connection is maintained so that there's no data loss. Using UDP is better for situations like this where I'm delivering a lecture and it doesn't matter if every single frame of my animations and moving hands and talking makes it because you'll be able to hear most of it and through context will be able to hear, understand what I'm trying to say. But if I'm sending you like an encryption key or a QR code or bank account information or anything personal, I want it over TCP so I know A, it's going to the right place and being received, and B, there's no loss of data because it could compromise whatever it is I'm sending. 
If everything ran over TCP, the internet would come to a grinding halt because it would mean that all of our traffic would multiply by at least a third, if not more, because the TCP connection does need to renew, and every time it renews, that's three or less. So we'll look at common apps. So file transfer and download. Uh, we can't. We don't want to lose anything with a download. That's super important, uh, and it's also not time sensitive, so we're okay with that one. But for real time audio and video, you guys don't want to have lag while I'm talking, right? Um, so again, TCP service, reliable transport between sending and receiving processes. We get flow control so the sender won't overwhelm the receiver and it throttles so the node the network is congested. So we prioritize network quality over. Um, hey, one of you I think has your microphone on. Can you just make sure all your mics are off? Um, uh, do, 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 do. UDP, unreliable data transfer. Uh, it's much better for things where connectionless, which we just covered. Um, and so we see the protocols, which are the rules we use for building our applications um, at the application layer. The layer below we care about because that's how it connects to the network, TCP or UDP. After that, it doesn't matter to us what happens because when the TCP connection is made or the UDP connection is made, um, the network has already been established by whoever built the network. It's already made a connection over all of the various ISPs and ISPs, and all of the cables obviously are connected to each other for any of that to work. So we're really only concerned with what protocol we're using to send the data from our application and what conduit it's taking to be transported to uh, where it's going. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So then we can start securing these. So we get things like TLS, which is, stands for Transport Layer Security, which builds a layer of encryption from the entire transport layer connection. Um, I should mention to clarify for those because this was something that I didn't realize not everyone knew last semester. The transport layer is the technology that provides an end-to-end -end connection from the client to the server. Um, layer three is any of the individual networks and layer two is the, the cables and stuff connecting the individual devices on a network and layer one is the physics that sends data either electrically or through radio waves. Um, so when I'm talking about the transport layer, I'm talking about a one-to-one -one connection um, over across many networks between two devices. And then when I'm talking about the application layer, I'm talking about how two pieces of software talk to each other over that connection. All right, so we look at web and HTML. Um, when we're looking at applications, we look at their names, but we also look at file types. So host names are things like www.someschool.edu, and that's what's given to a DNS server uh, to render an IP address to take you where you want to go. However, the path name is what I might put in an HTTP request, so that if I'm requesting a file, if I'm requesting a web page, whatever it is I'm requesting, because anything I click on and try to download is a request, it knows on the server where in its an operating system what file to give you for its browser to either download and render or for you to download on your client machine and look at it at your own pace. So again, we talked about, I think there's actually an animation for this one. Um, if a PC is making a request on Firefox to some web server, that request is made, and then there's a response. Meanwhile, at the same exact moment, an iPhone running a different web browser can also make the same request. So the transport layer connection is happening between the iPhone and the server, but the application layer connection is happening between the Safari web browser and the Apache web server operating system. Is that clear to everyone? Because that's actually a very important distinction. OK, I'm assuming. I, out of necessity, I'm assuming that you guys not saying anything means you understand it for the record. Okay, so the PC makes its request. The operating system on the server is using some operating system technique to manage all the requests and prioritize them in one way to respond to them individually. It's, it's responding with whatever file has been requested, but it happens that I don't think there's a server out there that's 
only dealing with one request at a time, like especially not ones that are majorly used that your applications will host. So that application layer connection over HTTP is exactly what um, we need to exchange data over the network, especially for most web applications. And HTTP uses a TCP connection um, because we're always downloading something and always requesting something. The server accepts the TCP connection and the application layer protocol exchange between the web browser and the web server um, makes the exchange and then the TCP connection is closed. Uh, that being said, HTTP is stateless. So the only way to track an exchange is by looking at its requests and its responses. Um, HTTP has no idea what it's doing in the grand scheme of things. It is just requests and responses, that's it. Then we get persistent and non-persistent HTTP. So if you are making a quick, some websites you might only access their homepage and then everything else is in JavaScript inside of it. So they might do a non-persistent HTTP so that you only get the connection that you're looking for and nothing else, it gets closed off. But if you're gonna be sustaining your connection and consistently going through like Wikipedia, for example, um, have you guys ever played the Wikipedia game where you pick two pages, random ones, and see who can go to the other one fastest? Um, I think at one point when I was working for defense, um, we started off at like door hinges and we tried to make it to World War II or something and we got like strangely good at it. Um, and so Wikipedia would be having a persistent HTTP connection because odds are you're gonna be clicking through the links and they don't wanna reopen the request. Okay, non-persistent HTTP. So we look here and it makes a HTTP connection opens. We make a connection at the server at the host that gets sent to the clients. We get the receive the message and okay, it continues good, that makes sense. Then the server closes the connection, uh, receives what they're looking for and then they repeat these steps every single time that anything else is requested. And this is actually pretty useful if you're like a, a website that downloads a lot of stuff, like if you're offering free wallpaper or something. Um, and then non and persistent HTTP response time. So we look at how many bounce backs there are. Okay. okay, and then persistent, the server leaves the connection open after sending the response. So it's kind of like when you're in a restaurant, you've ordered appetizers, the food's still coming, you might still want dessert. Uh, that's a persistent connection because it's still open with the server. But if you go to McDonald's or a fast food place, it's non-persistent because once you've made your order, they give it to you and you want a refill or you want something else, you have to go back, open a new transaction, pay for it again as a separate tab. So the two types of HTTP messages, um, request message. So we'll look at the header here get is the is the method it's used give me index.html so if ever you just type in a host name with no file type um, almost every server in the world is configured by default to look for index.html and failing that index.php to be the default landing page so it's saying get index.html which means the root page um, over http version 1.1 and then these lines here are telling the network what to go for so what's the host um, what's the user agent? So one of the things I'll be getting you guys to do is to configure your sites based on Firefox or Safari or Chrome as they're all built slightly differently. So this is a way of telling the website what browser you're using so you can have the best experience delivered. Um, what language it's using. So if it's an international website, um, you might find that it's English. Like one thing I, I was in Japan like six months ago and um, one thing I noticed was I had it never actually occurred to me that there was a website beyond the, the there's a web beyond the world of what I was used to and if I went looking for it it would be hard to find the web in another language but everything I was accessing in Japan started as Japanese until I changed um, some settings so what it's doing is looking at your location looking at your browser looking at where your data is coming from so it can know what default language to provide you so even things like google will come to the language that you wanted to come to um, encoding different browsers different computers use different coding so for example um when i was in the eighth grade i had a chinese exchange student come live with us for two months 
And he really liked using my personal laptop because it could read Chinese, but he didn't want to use the main computer. So I had to learn to share. Um, and it took me a while to figure out how to install Chinese characters onto the other computer in the house. And it's because um, North American computers to save space aren't always given the char set for all languages out there. So depending on which language your computer has, or doesn't have these are the ones it's telling the browser hey he can read these don't don't send them stuff that's just going to get corrupted or come as a question mark and confusing and then keep alive is how long the persistent connection should stay open for so then we see method url header field name value and the body that's the payload that's what's actually being sent and everything in the header is just the uh, mail headers know how to for things to know how to get where they're going okay other HTTP requests. Um, until they leave, uh, someone has asked me if keep alive was seconds. Um, I believe so, but that's one of those questions I'd have to check the RFC for. Um, I'm almost certain, but go check on the RFC for HTTP and you can let me know. Um, I can't imagine it being anything else. So we look at post methods. A post is another HTTP method. Um, user input sent from the client to server and the entity. So like that's if you're uploading something. Um, the get method is for downloading. So had, um, you'll almost, I can't actually think of a situation where you guys are gonna need to use this one. It's, I think it's more there for the developers, but it, um, it requests packets that don't have a body. So it's just testing the um, configuration of the connection. Uh, put methods, uh, uploads new file object to the server, completely replaces file that existed at specified URL. So when we're uploading files, we use the put method so the operating system knows to overwrite. Um, I'm sure you can imagine that these are that some of these protocols could be abused by hackers. So what we can do on our servers is configure who can use what. So if I'm hosting a web server, anyone can use the get method because that's kind of my business as a web, web host is people being able to get things. But I'm going to lock down the put method to only people that are contributing content so that someone can't come in and overwrite my entire operating system with some virus or something. Cool, and um, quick Googling says yes, the keep alive is in seconds. And then we have the HTTP response message, which is different from the request. Uh, the response usually contains the data that you are looking for. So the most common example is if I'm requesting the main page of like a page on Wikipedia, what's being contained in the response message is the HTML for the page I'm trying to load. And then my browser renders the HTML. Uh, recommended zone, cool. Okay, and HTTP comes with its own line of codes. So 200 means no problems, nothing to complain about, nothing, nothing wrong. Um, 301 is a message saying you've encountered an error, but it's, a, it's deliberate. Um, you were trying to access this, but we moved it to another part of the store. You know, we, it's now at the back of the store, go over there. Um, 400 means we have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, or we've never heard of what you're asking for. Um, the classic is 404, and then 500 is a server configuration error. So that means um, 500 means developers have screwed up, 400 means uh, users screwed up, screwed up, 300 means mutual misunderstanding, and 200 means everything's okay. All right, so we don't. Need... So if you guys want to on your own time, I recommend you try playing with HTTP for yourself. So if anyone's ever heard of the Telnet protocol before, it should be available by default in Linux and Mac. Um, one of the things you will hear me say a lot is I don't know Windows. Um, I used to support Windows 7 as an IT guy back in 2014 at Defense. And I can tell you a lot about specific Windows 7 things that are done to support office environments, but I have never developed software on Windows. So sometimes I'm gonna, defer to you PC gamers that know everything about Windows for advice on things like that. But if you, however you get Telnet on Windows, um, 
you can open up a connection and you can do a get request to this page and download um, download a file and you can see what that looks like in real time and that way you're seeing the basics of what a browser is doing. Okay. Maintaining user server state, we have cookies and we have sessions. So as I mentioned, HTTP is stateless. So the, the packets don't really have a concept of who they are relative to each other. All we have is packets flowing. So we have ways to remember that once you've put in your username and password and have been authenticated as a good user, you don't need to do that again. And so we have methods for that, like cookies, which are stored in the browser, and they're a token that's been securely created um, by, some, by some application. Um, there is a huge asterisk next to that. You can, I can just make a cookie, put my name in it, and then call that a cookie. Um, one of the first web applications I ever made, I was just learning about cookies, and I just put the username in the cookie and then checked if that cookie was there and figured that there was no other way somebody could get that cookie, but you can very easily um, just create a cookie on your own in the browser and copy in text, and if it's the same text, then it works. Um, so what, what people tend to do is they create like a secure hash string that goes in the cookie as a one-time authentication based on the way the browser requested information. And from there, that cookie can't be replicated with another browser in another instance. Um, we also use sessions to keep track of this stuff. So we load the record, it's okay. And we make the change so that we can see that the data is the data has been accessed properly, it hasn't been used out of order, and that the exchange of data between the client and server has been successful. What happens if a network connection crashes at T? Um, good question. So if it crashes on, if the network crashes on the client side, depending on um, the cookie, it can either be, the, the session can either be restarted by um, regaining, but if the cookie's been corrupted or if the cookie goes out of date, then the connection just has to be reestablished. Okay, websites and client browsers use cookies. So four components of a cookie, we have the cookie header line of the HTTP response message. We have the cookie header line in the next HTTP request and the cookie file kept on the user's host and the back end database of the website. So when I generate a cookie for you, I want to have a record of that. I'm keeping that in my database so that I can know who's associated with that cookie. Um, yes, Jared, user friendly is attacker friendly. Um, the, um, when I make a cookie, I want a record of that and I want it to be as ob obfuscated as possible, but I need to have a record of that somewhere so I know who you are and what your identity is so I can track you. Um, and every time there's an exchange between the client and the server, I want that cookie updated so that I know what the client is doing. Uh, so for example, if there's a shopping cart, I want to make sure that I'm tracking everything you're putting in the shopping cart and I know what you're trying to buy so that if you don't buy it, I can send you messages saying, hey, here's a discount because you forgot to buy this or something like that. So it gives me multiple advantages to track you with a cookie, but the um, the main one above all else that the internet wouldn't be the same without is the ability to, um, what's the word? The ability to not have to re-authenticate you with every single HTTP request. Okay. So eBay makes a cookie, 873400, and it makes an application layer HTTP request message. And then we make, then the client makes a request to a server and is also shopping with Amazon. So the client now has two cookies, one with eBay and one with Amazon. And then the server is able to see all the cookies you have, and they're actually able to build profiles about you. So we could maybe eBay and Amazon are gonna talk and see what things you buy so they can, they can say, hey, people who do targeted advertising, if you see this guy up there, he's really into old Pokemon cards, you should, you should show him more of those. So databases are keeping track of the cookies. So um, I don't advocate for the ethics of doing this. I actually put a lot of effort into not doing, not tracking this um, and trying to keep separate accounts and that kind of thing. Um, but I will teach you how to do it because you're not gonna be 
marketable in the industry without this knowledge. And you can use this knowledge to be privacy advocates. So if you think this, this kind of tracking is unethical, I'm right there with you, but I want you to know how it's done so that you can either put a stop to it or be an advocate for more privacy. All right, what cookies can be used for? Authorization, shopping carts, recommendations, and user session states. So we have challenges in how to keep state. We have um, maintaining state over multiple transactions. Uh, the easiest way to trim up a cookie is access the same server twice on different apps. Um, those of you, actually all of you would use Dell Online, what am I saying? Um, on Dell Online, my least favorite thing about it is if I access Dell Online on another computer before the session has expired on my phone or on my laptop, it will say session timed out and it will make me re-log in. So what that's saying is we authenticated you for X amount of time and we found that you weren't authenticated, we found that you logged in somewhere else. And so we have to close that existing connection because we're not sure if that's you. You now need to re-authenticate and create a new session. I have no idea why they make us go to another page that just says you've been logged out. I think that's a horrible thing, but um, I will tell you it's not Dell's fault because Carlton uses the same program and I get that same error all the time. It is infuriating. Um, that was like, it's taken me a lot to even start to leave Dell. And when I saw Carlton's thing, I was like, oh, cool. Maybe I won't, it'll be more fluent, but same program exactly. Um, one of the TAs, Alex Westhaver, told me he uses Dashlane to, to take care of it and Dashlane automatically redoes it. Uh, I've never tried it myself, but if, if it really bothers you, check out Dashlane. Okay. Okay, so web cache is proxy server, satisfy client requests without involving the original server. So let's say I host a web server here in Ottawa. And, oh, that's actually another quick side note. If ever I say the time and you're like, that's not the time, it's because I'm in Ottawa. I try really hard to only talk by Atlantic time, but just a quick note voice of it. So if I have a server here and you're in Halifax and it's gonna be making a lot of requests, like a lot of requests, what I might consider doing is setting up a proxy server somewhere closer to you guys that has a copy of all of my stuff and it downloads maybe once every 24 hours and then you guys can make a request so the request happens faster. So things like Netflix or Amazon or these, these bigger sites that work very hard to keep themselves up all the time, they've got servers all over the world that are just copies of what they are that are more accessible. And then once every 24 hours or so, these proxy servers download from the original source so that there's less traffic. Please start teaching at, do we have Algonquin College? It's funny, I actually, um, that, I don't, I've never heard a Dell person say gonk before. Um, uh, anyway, so what are we talking about? I oh, from I'm prior that, now I'm right. Um, I actually did an interview at Algonquin recently and um, they told me they'd hear, I, they'd hear back in three weeks, but that was now like four months ago, so. I tried. Anyway, um, so the web caching. Uh, web caching is how that works. So the Am Amazon here or whoever, they copy the sites and then it gets pulled from anywhere else in the world and that way it's more accessible, but at the same time you're only maintaining a smaller amount of servers and that way you're not spending all of your all of your network bandwidth replicating your servers. You've got other servers around the world that are eating that up. Um, web cache acts as both local client and server. Um, client and server, it's all about perspective. Uh, for example, to you going around in the world, to everyone you interact with, you are a client and everyone else is a server when you are exchanging any amount of information. So just like if you meet me in the world, to you, to me, you're a server, but to me, to you, I'm a server and we're both the client, right? So it's it's very perspective based yeah, and therefore a, pro a proxy. Can we get a mic check again, guys? I'm hearing some like mumbled moaning or something. Um, what, okay, yeah, in a, so that way, like depending on um, to Amazon, a cache server uh, would be a client because it's downloading, but to us, it's a server because we're downloading from them. Um, 
Okay, so catching example. Okay, we don't need to worry about this. Okay, and so we can program HTTP to have um, more like conditional stuff that we see in programming language. So if you have this, if this is new, if this um, if this has been modified, you know, we want it, but we don't want to download all the same things over again. So give you an example right now. Um, I recently learned about how to uh, jailbreak a Nintendo Wii, and that's been a good part of my summer. And one of the ways we've been able to do it is now I can just put in a disk and it'll be like, do you want to install this to a hard drive? And then we'll make an exact copy of the disk and put it to the hard drive. And this is legal as long as you own the original disc. And me and my friends have like this collective, this huge collection and um, we've slowly been adding to it. And one guy recently was like, I just added two games and it made me download 200 gigabytes. Why did it do that? And I was like, because you selected everything and tried to download it. You only want to download what's new. Otherwise you're going to ruin your, your bandwidth downloading stuff you already have. So this is one thing we can use conditionals for is to say only what I don't have, only what's new, um, anything of that regard so that we use less traffic. Because our goal is always to minimize the amount of traffic but maximize the experience. And things like downloading things we already have are just completely useful. Yeah. Okay, so HTTP has evolved over the years. Is there anything else I want to cover in here? So we can look at some email scenarios. So email is a little bit different than HTTP because instead of working on sending HTML that's wrapped, we're looking at sending mail. And mail is different than HTTP. Um, okay, so when referring to it, okay, we have a question from the chat. So when referring to a database in an auto refresh sense, there's no point reloading the data if the source files haven't been modified since the last load. Um, basically, there's no point in downloading stuff you don't already have saved. So if your source file doesn't already have whatever data it is, then it should absolutely be moved for data security and data integrity reasons alone. But there is no point in downloading and over and overriding the same data with the same information, all you're doing is eating up bandwidth. Does that answer your question? So with mail, we look at having a mail server and a mail client. Um, we have we have a sense of the outbox, but that hasn't really like we don't really use the outbox as much as we used to. Things always go through it, but in the old sense of old time email, um, there would be someone's desk who would have the outbox on it all day. And then one day the mailman comes in and takes the outgoing mailbox. And we have that sense in our mail clients for when there's no outgo when there's no internet connection. Like if ever you try using Outlook in offline mode, which I've never seen anyone voluntarily try to do, but I've seen thousands of public servants accidentally end up in that mode. Everything goes in the outbox waiting until there's another network connection. Um, so you really only ever see the outbox when things can't go out right away, but we do keep a queue of what's going. And the simple mail transfer protocol, SMTP, is the protocol we use for facilitating this transfer of mail. So I don't think I need to explain what a mailbox is or a message queue, but I will work on the SMTP protocol. So again, we have clients and servers. Um, email uses TCP because it would be very, very bad if our messages lost part of their integrity. Um, it could send the very wrong message if the word don't or not or some negation was sent. and a partial message arrives saying to do a bad thing rather than not do a bad thing. We want to make sure that that data is, in, is integral. Um, our payload is again the message body and there's just a couple specific things that are necessary to facilitate SMTP. Um, you won't be working with them as much uh, because in this course we're mostly focused on HTTP. Okay. 
All right, so um, scenario, Alice sends email to Bob. Alice uses UA to compose email message to Bob at some school.edu. Alice's UA sends message to her mail server message placed in the message queue. So we get her user agent, sends it to the mail server. And for all of us at Dalhousie, we use the same mail server. It's some variation of uh, Microsoft Office 365. Uh, but for example, if I'm sending mail from my Dell email to my Carlton email, what's going to happen is I'm going to send a message from my mail client. It's going to go to the Dell email server. Then from the Dell email server, it's going to make a connection to the Carlton email server and be transferred there. And then my whatever client I'm using for my Carlton account will reach up to the server and grab the mail when it does its fetch it, however, however long it is. See, nice and simple, right? Anyone have any questions about how that works? The key, the key principle to take away here is the concept of different mail servers versus same mail servers. So things that are on the same domain have the same mail server, at least in theory, or at least if it's a collection of servers, they'll be grouped in the same local area network, whereas things on different networks and different domains will require a transfer of the message between two different mail servers. Is there anyone who requires any explanation on that? No? Okay. So this is what an SMTP message looks like base level when it's being intercepted or transmitted. Um, we have a message, we have codes, um, we have mail from, mail to, recipient to, data, that's the body, and then quit. So 250 means everything's okay, um, at least in SMTP speak. I did at one point have to make a mail server for one of Nero's classes. It was a lot of fun, so we might try to do that. But um, my knowledge of the H of SMTP codes is nowhere near my knowledge of the HTTP code. So I'll skip along a bit. Um, all right, perfect. So let's try to do a little bit of DNS, and then we can be done for the day. I think we're almost at the time. Um, so domain name system is basically just the phone book of the internet. So we can't possibly be expected to remember IP addresses. The only one I know off the top of my head for any website in the world is 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 because that's Google's DNS and that's generally the default one that most technicians use when they're setting stuff up. Uh, other than that, internet, other than that, everything needs to go through a DNS server. We can't have internet without DNS unless you know the address. So when you make a request, and say you type in facebook.com, uh, your computer is gonna say, do I have this in my ta address table? Do I know where this is? And if they know where it is, you're going straight to it. But if they don't know, what's going to happen is it's going to open a new HTTP connection to a DNS server and send the name of the domain to the DNS server. And the DNS server is going to see if it knows it. And if, does, if it doesn't know it, it's going to go to its superior in the hierarchy all the way up to the top level domain of the internet um, to figure out where this website is you're trying to go to and then once it finally finds it it returns to you the ip address and then from there um, the same process is repeated with routing tables to get you to whatever ip address you're trying to get to has everyone heard of these concepts before so when i say routing table what happens is the router that's supposed to leave the network um, as i said before routers are the gateway out of any network it's going to say, hey, I've, have you seen this IP address before? And if it knows where to go, it's going to fire it off to another direction. It doesn't care about it once it's fired off. And the next router it hits, uh, that router is going to go, oh, maybe I don't know where this is. I'll ask my buddy. Or it might say, oh, I know where this is. I last sent it off to the left, and it fires it off. It doesn't think about it again until it makes it to uh, the final connection. So the DNS is super dangerous. Um, they're coming out now with encrypted DNS because people can abuse it so easily. Uh, so, for example, a lot of exploits that I know how to do for video games rely on faulty DNS. So, to jailbreak my Nintendo Wii, what I did was I changed the DNS server on the Wii, and then I tried to download the user agreement. So, what happens is I put in this DNS server, and the Wii says, okay, I'm going to download the user agreement. I'm going to make this HTTP request. I don't remember how to get to Nintendo, though, so DNS, please tell me. And DNS says, hey, it's actually over here. Come with me. I'm the back. And the Wii gets to where it's going, which is the faulty, which is now this fake DNS server. And it says, here you go. Here's the user license agreement. Please download and execute this. 
and the Wii does, thinking it's talking to Nintendo legitimately, and it actually downloads um, a letter bomb that gives me control of the kernel. And from there, it's we have control of the Wii, but all it took to trick the Wii into doing what I wanted to do while it stayed doing what, while it maintained thinking it was doing what it's supposed to do, was sending it to the DNS and it went to someone it thought it trust, but it, it shouldn't have. And that's why DNS is such a powerful protocol is we can, we can make the computers think they're genuinely doing the right thing when they're actually talking to a server that's intending to trick them. All right. Does anyone have any questions about today's lecture? Because I think we're out of time. Is there anyone who would like to talk to me after class or anything like that? Um, we can arrange that somehow. But otherwise, if no one has questions, we can sign off. I'll hang out for a few minutes in case anyone does. Thanks, have a great day.